In this section, we're going to go a little more in depth into ray tracing. Ray tracing is the main physics used in Optics Studio, which does a complete mathematical treatment. It's a powerful tool to determine parameters of optical systems. Ray tracing by hand is extremely laborious and skill intensive, so it's good we have programs like Optics Studio to do it for us. The basic idea is that light originates from a point on an object, and we follow it through the system. Each time it encounters a surface, it is either going to refract or reflect. If it reflects, it will follow the law of reflection. And if it refracts, which is what we'll mainly be considering in this section, they'll follow Snell's law, which will dictate the new direction of the light after refraction. Rays don't always converge to a single point on the image plane. So in this image down here, this is a optical system. Each color of rays here originate from a single point on the object, and you can see they converge on the image plane. But depending on where on the image plane, whether it's on axis or further off axis, the quality of the spot differs. So on the optical axis is a pretty small spot, but it's not infinitesimally small as an idealized system would have. Then as we go off, it blurs out more due to more aberrations. Each spot in each of these spot diagrams is the result of a ray being traced through the system. So you can imagine to make a spot diagram like this, you need to trace 100 or so rays through the system because there's about 100 dots in this spot diagram. In the rest of this video, we're going to be looking at ray diagrams for some singlet and doublet systems. So you can imagine doing these by hand, tracing 100 rays isn't going to work for us. So instead, we're going to be using some mathematical approximations. We'll be assuming thin lenses with the paraxial approximation. What this allows us to do is assume that all rays will actually converge to a single point if they originated from the same point on the object. So instead of having to trace 100 rays to make a spot diagram, you know where two rays converge, you know that every other ray from that point on the object converges at that point as well. This is a simplified version, but hopefully it will help us gain a better intuitive understanding of what ray tracing can accomplish. With these assumptions, we can use a few rules to help us trace rays through our system. One, rays traveling parallel to the axis that are refracted by the lens will be refracted such that they travel through the focal point of the lens. This is illustrated by the purple ray in the diagram. Two, Rays running through the center of the lens will travel straight through with no refraction. Technically, the rays are refracted at each side of the lens, but they will cancel out such that the path is straight. If you have a thick lens, then the path that it takes through the lens between being refracted by the two sides will displace the ray so it's jogged down instead of going straight through. This is why we're assuming a thin lens, so we can assume that that path that's traveling through the center of the lens is negligible, and we can approximate it as straight. Third, rays that travel through the focal point of the near side of the lens and then are refracted will be refracted such that the ray travels parallel to the optical axis after refraction, as illustrated by the green ray in the diagram. Note that this first and third rule, uh, depicted by the green and purple ray, are actually the same rule. Just consider the reciprocity of light. That says that the light traveling forwards and backwards through the system must take the same path. So I could say this green ray is going through the focal length and being refracted such that it's parallel to the optical axis. If I were to follow it backwards, it's going parallel to the optical axis, then refracted such that it travels through the focal point. So these two rules are just flip sides of the same coin. Some common terminology that we're going to be using throughout this video, things like object. The object is whatever you're imaging and where the rays or light is originating from. So the focal point of the lens, that's where if you shine rays parallel to the lens, those rays will converge at the focal point. We will be assuming that we know the focal lengths and thus the focal points of all the lenses in this uh, section. This is reasonable because for any lens, you can easily experimentally determine where the focal point is. You just shine some rays in parallel and wherever they converge is the focal point. 
Then there's the image plane. The image plane is where the image is formed. It's where you would place a screen if you want to project the image or a sensor if you want to record the image. You determine it by wherever the rays originating from the same point on the object converge. That is where your image plane is. In order to do ray tracing by hand, we're going to define some principal rays, which we'll use to determine the location and size of the resulting image. The first principal ray is the one that we trace from the top of the object. It runs parallel to the optical axis and then is refracted through the lens and passes through the focal point of the lens in the case of a convex lens over here, or is refracted away from the optical axis, and if we were to trace it backwards, would pass through the near focal point of the lens. The second principal ray, which is often also called the chief ray, is the one that originates from the top of the object and passes through the center of the lens and exits with no effect from refraction, so it travels straight through the lens. Note technically the chief ray is the one that passes through the center of the aperture. In this case we haven't defined an aperture, so the lens is our aperture, so the center of the lens is where the chief ray is traced. Then finally we have our third ray. This will be the one that we trace from the top of the object through the near focal point, and then it will exit the lens traveling parallel to the optical axis. Note we don't actually need to trace this. We really only need two rays to define where the image is because we've said that under our approximations, all the rays will converge to the same point, so two is sufficient. But sometimes it's nice to trace this one just for a complete diagram. The same lens may form an image differently depending on where the object is placed. We're going to be looking at singlets with focal length f for objects placed at various different locations. One, infinitely far away. Two, beyond two times the focal length not much farther than that, three exactly at two times the focal length, four between the focal length and two times the focal length, five precisely at the focal length, and six between the focal length and the lens. We want to know how these different object distances affect the resultant image. So here's our first case where the object is placed infinitely far away. Notice that in this case, all rays will be coming in parallel to their lens approximately. Therefore, they'll all be focused to approximately the focal point of the lens. The resulting image is minimized. It's a real image. That means if I look, I can see the rays converging. I don't have to do any extra tracing back of the rays to find where the image would be. And it's formed at the focal point. Note that the focal plane and the image plane in this case are exactly the same. This is only the case for very far objects. Case two, where the object is beyond two times the focal length of the lens, you can look at where the ray tracing ends up, and we have an image that is minimized, so it's smaller than the original object. It's inverted, which means it is upside down. You can see the object is sticking up from the optical axis, whereas the image is sticking downwards from the optical axis. It's real, so again, if I were to place a screen on this image plane, I could see a projection of the image. And it is formed between the focal point and two times the focal point on the opposite side of the lens. Case three, where the object is placed at exactly two times the focal length, the resulting image will be exactly the same size, will be real, inverted, and formed at exactly two times the focal length on the opposite side of the lens. Case four, if my object is between two times the focal length and the focal length of the lens, my resulting image will be magnified, so it's larger than the initial object. It is inverted, so it's still upside down. It's real and formed beyond two times the focal length on the opposite side of the lens. In case five, where the object is placed at the focal point, there's no image formed at all. 
we can see that the rays that pass through the lens leave parallel to each other. If the rays are parallel, they will never meet, no matter how far we trace them, so there's no image plane because there's no point of convergence of the rays. Similarly, if we were to trace them backwards, they're still parallel, so we can't find a virtual image plane either. So when you place an object at the focal point of a lens, there is no image formed at all. In our last case, where the object is placed between the focal point and the lens, the rays that pass through the lens will diverge, so there will be no point where they meet. In order to find where the image plane is, we must trace these rays backwards and extend them to find the point of convergence. This means our image is virtual. Anytime you have to do this extra backwards ray tracing, you will have a virtual image. Our image is upright, magnified, and formed on the same side of the lens as the object. Next, we'll take a look at what happens when there's more than one lens in the system. To approach this, we're going to treat the lenses one by one, use ray tracing to find the image of the first lens, and then we'll treat the image of the first lens as the object used for the ray tracing of the second lens. So I take my object and I trace my two principal rays to find where my image one forms. Image one is now my object. I trace my two principal rays using lens two to find where the image for lens two forms, and that will be the image of the entire system. Note that in this, I did not trace any one single ray through the system. None of these rays actually follow this whole path through the system. But we can now do that if we want to using the information we figured out. I take a ray originating from my object, trace it to the first lens. I know from there it is going to pass through the point on the image that matches the object, in this case the tip of the object. It encounters my second lens, and from there it's traced to my image 2, or the final image formed by the system. You could do this with any number of optical elements, so if you want to ray trace through an entire system, you could use this repeatedly over hundreds of elements if you wanted to. Let's take a look at a system that has a convex lens. We can treat this the same way. I take my rays originating from my object, trace them through lens one. Note they diverge because this is a con uh, concave or diverging lens. If I were to trace the rays backwards to find my virtual image, I can now use this virtual image as the object for my second lens. Follow the same rules, take my two principal rays. I can then find where image two or the image of the whole system would form. Same idea as before, if I want to trace a single ray through the system, I take a ray traced to the lens. By tracing back to my virtual image, I can determine the direction of the ray after passing through the first lens, and then I know it has to end up on my image in the point that corresponds to my object, and I've traced this ray through the entire system. So even if your system has virtual images partway through, you can still use this ray tracing method to trace a ray all the way through the system. We can also use ray tracing when we add an aperture to the system to determine things like the entrance pupil. The entrance pupil is the optical image of the physical aperture of the system as viewed from the object side of the lens. So if we were to hold up our camera and look through the lens, you would see an image of the aperture stop. That image is not necessarily in the same place as the physical aperture stop, and so that image is what we call the entrance pupil. It can differ in size and location, and often it's used uh, in specifications for things like F number rather than the actual physical aperture. The entrance pupil is the center of perspective or the viewpoint of the camera. So if you're doing something like taking a panorama image, You'd want to rotate the camera, keeping the entrance pupil in the same place in order to be able to stitch the images together properly. To find the entrance pupil using ray tracing, we'll start by tracing rays from the top of the object that just make it through either side of the aperture. Then we'll do the same thing starting with the bottom of the object, 
trace the rays that just make it through the aperture. We'll then extend these rays out and look for the locations where they meet. The locations where they meet, those define the entrance pupil. So for this lens system here, the entrance pupil is right in this region between uh, these two lines we've drawn circled by these red dots. We can also use ray tracing to find the exit pupil. The exit pupil is the optical image of the physical aperture when viewed from the image side. So from the perspective of the sensor, if you were to look from there, the optical image of the, of the aperture is your exit pupil. Only rays that pass through the exit pupil will be able to exit the system. And exit pupils are often important for designing eyepieces. Usually you want the exit pupil designed to be similar in size to the human pupil diameter um, because you want the light that's actually leaving your system to go into the eye of the person looking through the eyepiece. What this design looks like might depend on what the application is. If you're using a telescope, you're generally going to have a larger exit pupil because telescopes are used in dim light when people's pupils are dilated. So you need a larger exit pupil to match the eye's diameter. If you're using something like binoculars that are often used in daylight, say at a baseball game or for bird watching, then the human pupil is going to be smaller because of the bright conditions. In this case, you probably want a smaller exit pupil to match that diameter. So we'll do a similar thing. We want to see where the image of this aperture is. So we'll just trace rays originating from the top of the aperture through lens two. We'll trace rays originating from the bottom of the aperture through lens two. And we can look at where this image forms and that will be our exit pupil. That is our intro to ray tracing. Thank you for watching. In the next chapter, we'll be looking at some optical specification parameters.